Hi folks, in this video we start doing formal proofs with quantifiers in FOL. So pause your videos now and see if you can solve this proof using the rules that you've learned from the textbook. Okay, that was your chance to try to work through this problem. Now that we have quantifiers like this universal quantifier on the premise or this existential quantifier on the conclusion, we're going to have to know how the quantifier intro and elim rules work. But don't think, this gets slightly more complicated than propositional logic, but don't think that this is fundamentally different. The guiding principle is exactly the same. Remember our mantra is look at the main connective. Well, now that we have quantifiers on the scene, the umbrella term, the genera term for quantifiers and connectives is operator. But I've been saying all along, look at the main connective. I'll still say look at the main connective, but what I mean now is look at the main operator. The thing that is widest scope still defines how you use a sentence or what you need to do to get to a sentence. So when I say look at the main connective, I mean look at the thing with widest scope, whether it's a quantifier or a connective. That will tell you how to, how to use the thing, how to, how to approach the proof. So I look at premise one and I see a universal quantifier out here. So I think, okay, I need to know how my universal elimination works. Or I see my existential conclusion down here. And I think, okay, I'm gonna to have to introduce that existential sentence at some point. So I better know how existential intro works. All right, let's, let's start working through this example to, to put these, these rules into action. The first thing I did in this proof is I instantiated premise number one. Universal elim is a really helpful rule. It's nice. So anytime you see universal premises, this is always how you're going to use them. You're gonna you're gonna move from a purely general claim about all objects to a particular claim about some object. The schema for this rule just says anytime you have a universal, like for all x p of x, you can instantiate that universal for any name you want in your entire language. So I can put a in in the name a place of x and cite universal elim. And you can do it more than once. I could then put P of B down here and cite universal elim. So the citation is the same. Since it holds for every object, you can just keep going back to it over and over again. And you get to choose whatever name you want. Now, which name should you choose? That depends upon the particular proof. If you chose A here, it would have done you no good. Because you, another thing you should do is scan around in the proof, look for patterns, look for names that are already in use. Like this premise used the name E. So that's why I instantiated this for E down here. It wouldn't be very helpful to know P, P of A arrow Q of A because that wouldn't let me do anything with premise number three. So, so when you see universal premises, this is actually a really happy situation. They're wonderful to use because you just get to start instantiating them for names. And then when you try to pick a name, look around for other names in the proof that might tell you which name you should choose. If there's no obvious choice, then maybe you should just go with A, but usually there's gonna be something that indicates what name you should be picking. Now that I see P of E and P E arrow Q of E here, I just think, okay, I'm gonna do modus ponens. Let's do arrow E them. Remember, everything you've learned in bool and prop still applies. So anytime you see a wide scope arrow and you've also got the antecedent, just, just do modus ponens on it. We can just keep making progress here. That's how we use arrow sentences. Now we've, we're stuck here. This is a literal, but remember, we've only used premises one and three so far. We haven't used premise number two. So what I'm gonna to have to do with that one is instantiate it as well. The general lesson here is, this is how you always use universal premises. So when you start seeing these universal, these quantifier proofs, universal, universal premises are a very helpful way to start the proof. Okay, now that I have those, that universally eliminated, again, I chose E because that's the obvious choice. It connects with premise number five. I can do arrow E them again. And now I've proven that E has property R. I'm trying to prove something has property R, but, and I've proven E does. So that just is how we get to show that something has property R. Existential intro is really simple. If you wanna have an existential claim like somebody is happy, all you have to do is prove of a particular person that they are happy. And then you know the general fact somebody is happy because you know Ralph is happy or Eduardo was happy. So, Existential intro is also a very nice rule to use. All you have to do, here's the schema for the rule, is prove for some particular name that it has a property, and then you can generalize on it. You can make the move to the existential claim about somebody or other having that. And you put in the variable that you're binding here, the X for the A. When you do this rule, you get to choose whichever variable you want. Remember, X, Y, and Z, they're all completely interchangeable. So the reason I chose X is just because my conclusion was had an X figuring in it. If this conclusion had a Z in it, I would have justified, the justification would have been the exact same. 
uh, and I just could have had a Z here as well. So, so sometimes you have to think, um, when I do universal enum, which name do I want? And when I do existential intro, which variable do I want? And generally paying attention to other parts of the proof is gonna help answer those questions for you. Okay, let's just review what we're doing here because we're moving into a new phase of the course. In the last couple of weeks, we've been learning first order logic. This is our, our massive complete logical system. The final logical system we're learning in this course. And like all our logical systems, it has three parts. It's got the formal language, the semantics, and the proof theory. You've previously learned the language, you know, what counts as an open formula? When are variables free or bound? Uh, how do you make atomic sentences? How does the identity predicate with this infix notation work, et cetera? You've also learned the semantics. So when are these sentences true or false? Like for example, identity always must mean identity. And here are the semantics for the quantifiers. You know, for all x, p of x is true, just in case every object has property p. And you need a domain of quantification. So you've, the formal language and the semantics we've been talking about quite a bit. Now we're finally getting to the proofs. And now that we have so many different symbols in our language, we've got the old proofs. You already have mastered all of these proofs of the connectives. All of these rules are the first you know, seven weeks of the course, which you've, which you've built. And now we're adding rules for the quantifiers, intro and elim rules for all of our new symbols, the universal, the existential, and the identity predicate. And, and they're gonna connect with all of this previous stuff. So that's why the course really is cumulative and you have to have mastered all of that previous material and we're just gonna build on it now. So our goal here is to learn these six new rules. And in this video, I've just been talking about two of them because those are the two easy rules. Um, putting identity aside, when we just focus on the quantifiers, there's an easy rule and an annoying rule for each quantifier. Remember, remember reductio rule for negation was annoying because it required subproofs. Or proof by cases for disjunction was kind of annoying because it required subproofs. Well, these two rules, universal intro and existential elim, those are annoying rules because they're gonna require subproofs. But these are the easy ones. Anytime you have a universal premise, life is easy. You just eliminate it. And anytime you're trying to prove an existential, you know, life is easy. You just introduce it. So, so don't think that quantifier proofs are always difficult. Sometimes they don't even require subproofs. And here's the analogy. Universal quantifier is a lot like a conjunction, actually. Because think about it this way. If I'm saying every object in the domain has property P, what if I only had a finite number of objects in my domain, like A, B, and C? Well, then the universal claim that everything has P is a lot like just saying A has P, B has P, and C has P. So a universal quantifier is quite a bit like a conjunction. And that's why universal elim is easy. Conjunction elim is easy too. Similarly, or on the flip side, a disjunction is in a universal quantifier. A universal, uh, excuse me, an existential quantifier is a lot like a disjunction. So when I wanna say something has property P, if I only have three objects in my domain, A, B, and C, that's kind of like saying either A has P or B has P or C has P. So an existential is in, so, is in many ways similar to a disjunction. And existential intro is easy, just like disjunction intro is easy. If I'm trying to prove something has property P, all I have to do is prove it of some object or other, and then I can move on to the general claim. I use the term general of generalization here because it's a really common name for the informal proof methods. So besides calling it universal elim and existential intro, really common words, instead of intro, when we're talking about informal proofs, when we do quantified proofs in English, then generalization is this move because, because when I'm saying A has property P and then someone has property P, I'm moving from a particular claim about A to a general claim about someone or other. It's more general to, say, to put it in quantificational terms. Or when I move from a general claim about every object having property P, then when I move from that to a particular claim about E or A having property P, I'm instantiating the general claim for a particular one, and that's called instantiation. So, so universal intro and universal elim are often just called universal generalization, universal instantiation, et cetera. I will use these English names when we're talking about informal proofs, and I'll use the intro and elim names when we're talking about formal proofs. Okay, thanks.